Suppose you have a function on some domain A, some open domain A inside of Rn, and this function takes values in some codomain, let's say Rm. And look at just one of the points in the domain inside the interior, and imagine whether or not you had a differentiable function or whatnot, you can always just look at sort of a one-dimensional piece of f by drawing a coordinate axis near that point that you've chosen. Let's call this point c, for example. And imagine restricting your function to one of these axes. That defines for you a function from r to rm or at least some subset of R if A is not all of Rn itself. So what we have is, we have a function from let's say R, or again some subset of R is A, if A is not all of Rn itself, which we'll denote by phi C semicolon I. And what this function is doing is it's going to take this axis and it's essentially going to place the axis whose origin, 0, lies at C in the ith direction. So again, since this is a subset of Rn, there's some axis way out here, some n-dimensional uh, coordinate basis axis, and all we're doing is we're sort of shifting that coordinate basis over here. Let's say if it was in three dimensions, it would look something like this. So the definition of this function at the point, let's call it uh, for now t, and then we'll choose a better notation in a second, or even better, let's call it h. So it sends h and r to the point. Now it's going to send everything to the value c, so everything is going to be at that point c, except the ith coordinate. So it's going to go to c1, c i minus 1, and then we're going to put where i is at the ith place, h. c i plus 1, all the way up to c n, since we're in n dimensions. Now, as h varies, this is exactly giving us the line through c along the ith axis. That's what this function is doing. So when we compose these two functions, we will get a function of a single variable as its input mapping into Rm. And for simplicity, if we take m equals to 1, then this just gives us an ordinary real valued function from R to R. So let's denote this by f composed with phi c i. Now, whether or not f is differentiable, it makes sense to ask if this function is differentiable. And I see here there's a little mistake. I should have written not at the origin. This is at the point ci, the ith coordinate of c. ci gets placed here. So let's now consider the derivative of this function if it exists. So if f applied to this of this composition um, is differentiable at the point ci then denote its derivative by partial i f at c and just to be clear this is the derivative of this function at c i. So this is probably maybe something you've seen in a multivariable calculus course. This is a more precise definition of what the partial derivative is and we are not making any assumptions 
about whether f is differentiable as a function from Rn to Rm at C. So with this definition, we can think about it yet in one more way that's convenient. And another way in which we can think of is instead of looking at the inclusion of this axis into here at the origin C, we can imagine that we have a curve passing through the point C like so. So we have a curve that passes through C. And it's, it hits C exactly at zero, and the derivative of this curve is precisely the ith unit vector. So this is yet another way of looking at it. We can define gamma at the point C in the ith direction to be the function from R to Rn given by gamma C EI evaluated at T is C plus T EI. So at zero it gives me C and if I take the derivative of this function you can check that the derivative, the differential, is a linear map from R to Rn and being a linear map from R to Rn it's completely determined by where the number one goes and the number one goes precisely to EI. That's something you can check. And we can define the partial derivatives using these curves as well. And this perspective will be much more useful when we don't necessarily have a straight line curve going through C. You can imagine that C could, for instance, be the unit circle in R2. And there we can't just take uh, the partial derivatives. It might not seem reasonable. It might not be clear how to even take the partial derivatives of a function on the unit circle. But what we can do is we can look at a curve inside the circle and then differentiate that and use that to define partial derivatives. But that will be later when we talk about manifolds. For now, let's go back to the perspective of partial derivatives in terms of this definition and let's assume that f is itself a differentiable function. So we have a theorem that says if f is differentiable at C, where F and C are as here, then the differential of D associated to F is given by DCF and it's a matrix whose coordinates are given precisely by D1, F1 at C, D 2, F1 at C, and so on, all the way up to Dn, F1 at C. And it goes down in this direction, where you take the first partial derivative of the mth component function, and evaluate at C, and so on, all the way up to Dn, Fm at C. So it turns out that this matrix is the differential of f at c. In other words, the differential is expressed entirely in terms of partial derivatives. Now, instead of proving this theorem, it's not really a difficult exercise. I'll leave that to you. Um, let's focus on what happens if the difference, if the derivatives exist, if all of these partial derivatives exist, I can construct this matrix. It makes sense as a linear operator. And if the partials all exist, DCF can be defined as a linear transformation from Rn to Rm, right? There's nothing preventing us from defining this matrix if we know that each of these values exist. However, it turns out that even if the partial derivatives exist, the function f might not be differentiable at c. 
and you might think that's a little strange, I've just constructed what I think is the derivative, what goes wrong? Well, don't forget that the differential is not just a linear transformation, it's a linear transformation that satisfies an additional important property. This condition was that the limit as h approaches 0 of the function f of c plus h minus f of c minus dcf evaluated at h over the norm of h. And this limit has to equal 0. So it's not just enough to construct this matrix. You have to make sure that this matrix satisfies this condition for it to be a differential. And why intuitively should we even ask for this definition in the first place? Well, think about it this way. This is the value of f at c, and this is the value of f at an infinitesimally close neighboring point. And dcfh is telling us that if we take that vector, that vector that points from c to c plus h, so let me draw the c, and here's here's the vector h, this is c plus h, and so this is telling us that the value of the function, the difference between these two functions is essentially given by the value of this differential applied to that vector h. So it's telling us that these two functions are very, very close and that this derivative is a good approximation to the difference of those two functions. It's a good approximation to the function at, at evaluated at c plus h if you know the value at c. So actually, I, I sort of feel like giving a, a, a little proof of this. Um, let's just give a proof sketch in the case where m equals 1. So when m equals 1, what the claim is saying is that dcf evaluated at, e, at the vector ei is equal to the partial derivative of f evaluated at c. This is what the claim is. And earlier I mentioned, from this perspective in terms of these paths, we know that the differential of is equal to the vector ei. And if I replaced ei here by any other vector v, the same situation would be true. And so this is actually a, a special case, again, of the chain rule. So what we can do is we can look at the composition of these two functions. Either we can look at the perspective of paths or what I've written over here. And so what we have is we have a function from r to rn back to r. So here's f. Here is our function gamma. C, E, I, and this is our composition function. And when we take the derivative of this thing, this will give us the partial derivative in the ith direction. So applying D to this picture, this diagram, we get the differential of gamma and we know, again, that the differential of gamma is just going to give us a single vector. But let me write that out anyway. d at 0 of gamma c ei. And here we have r. And this is d of f. Where is it evaluated? It's evaluated when we push forward 0. 0 gets mapped to c. So it's evaluated at c. And here, this is going to be partial derivative of f. Let me write it out exactly what it is. d0 at f composed with gamma c ei. And this diagram commutes by the chain rule. So if we write this out, d0 f gamma c ei, if we work our way backwards a little bit, this this composition here and taking its derivative is exactly what's, this, what's given by this formula right here. You can check that these two are equivalent. If you write out the definition of what such a derivative means of a single variable, you'll see that these two conditions are precisely the same, literally. Um, and so what we have here is that this 
is equal to the ith partial derivative of f at c by definition of the partial derivative. And then using the chain rule here, we get that this equals dcf composed with d0 gamma c e i. And now let's just check by plugging in a vector what this gives us. So if I plug in the vector 1, what happens? If I plug in the vector 1 by the earlier comment I made before, this gets sent to the vector ei. And then ei gets eaten up by the linear transformation dcf. And this exactly says, I'm looking at the ith column here, and the ith column in the case where m equals 1 is just a single entry, and that's exactly this partial derivative here. That's what it's telling us. So this is a rather easy proof of the fact that if f is differentiable, then its matrix derivative can be expressed in terms of the partial derivatives. Unfortunately, the converse is not true. Even if you know all the partial derivatives exist, there are examples of functions for which these partial derivatives exist, but this limit does not equal zero. And there are a few exercises in the notes that give examples of such functions. So you should be aware that as soon as you add this extra dimension, a whole new level of complications arises between what exactly you mean by taking the derivative, what is, what is the derivative of some function. You have to be very precise about what you're doing.